Hello, and welcome to This Week in Hearing. I no longer remember how many times I've opened the podcast by pointing out that speech and noise is the last frontier in hearing device performance, and therefore the focus of more than one recent product announcement. Sonova is no exception. After a period of incremental improvements comes a major new line for Phonak called Infineo, with several models, including a custom rechargeable and a cross, all based on a new chip called ERA. But the big news is the addition of a second chip called DeepSonic in the Sphere model. DeepSonic is designed specifically for providing real-time separation of speech from noise, a first for an in-ear device of any kind. We'll get into that and consider it in context of overall AI development. But first, Let's hear from Christine Jones what's new across the Infineo line and how it impacts both hearing care professionals and their patients. I met up with her at Phonax Media Event in New York City a week before the launch. I have with me Christine Jones. She's the Senior Director of Marketing for Phonak and a research audiologist by background. Thanks for joining me, Christine. Thanks for having me, Andy. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, tell people a little bit more about your background. Yep, so I started as a clinical audiologist. I've worked in pediatrics and adults. Um, always had a passion for Phonak technology. Uh, working in pediatrics, I had a lot of experience with it clinically and um, joined Phonak as a clinical trainer about 150 years ago. And um, I've done various jobs in audiology, including starting and running the Phonak Audiology Research Center, which was our first clinical research lab that Phonak opened in the US and um, more recently took the job um, to run marketing for Phonak in the U.S. where um, I could take all of that clinical know-how and really try to apply it to our, our marketing and our, our brand communications and, and really try to focus on, on a strong clinical um, messaging tied, tied closely to the, to the needs and desires of our HCPs. So you really bring a good broad background to what you do today. I hope so. I also have a lot of people in my life with hearing loss, and so I, I live it every day, and um, I'm, I'm really passionate in, in what the technology can do in people's lives and the importance of hearing care in people's lives, so it's a, it's a good job to have. So let's talk about that technology. Now, we're, we've covered the, the deep neural network, the speech and noise separation already, but uh, in this product line, one of the six products has that capability, but the other five have a range of other improvements that make the experience better than the predecessor models, correct? Yes. I think there's a few things to talk about here. Um, sound quality was really paramount in the design of this product. And of course, sound quality for speech and noise remains a top consumer need. Um, but we felt like there was room across the board to really try to optimize the experience, both from that moment of truth at the first fit, and then when that repeat user goes out and re-experiences you know, music and speech and, and all of the different surroundings and how to just wow somebody ac across the board. So for starters, we have our APD, 3.0 prescriptive fitting formula, which is the adaptive phonic digital formula. We did a study in Park um, at, when we implemented that change and we put users in hearing aids for the first time in the Infineos. And we found um, that compared to a competitive device, 93% of the users had a spontaneous preference for that APD first fit that we implemented here. So we believe from an HCP standpoint where you wanna put hearing aids on a person and really just bowl them over with delight from that first moment that, that they're going to get that, that reaction. Okay, so in other words, 93% of the time people are satisfied with the first fit. Exactly right. Okay, and then in other cases you come back and do real ear and all the rest of it. But if a person's perfectly satisfied with the first fit 93% of the time. Right. Okay, which has interesting implications for uh, telecare as well, because if I, for example, am in a rural area, mm -hmm. you could then theoretically give a pretty good experience with a remote first fitting, even if they come back to an audiologist in person later for fine tuning, yep. but you're able to deliver a pretty good experience for a person who cannot easily get to 
Yep. an in-person uh, clinic. And for sure, you know, we enable people to do fine tuning remotely as well um, for patients that don't happen to be able to come in easily or are remote. But um, but yeah, very highly satisfied sound, sound quality out of the gate. But you also have a thing called the yep. AI dome proposer. Yes. What is that? Okay, so this feels like a funny thing for us to talk about in a world where um, the other topics that you're exploring with this device are you know, 4.5 million connections in a, in a deep neural network with online real-time signal processing. You know, the dome feels like kind of a, a low-tech um, pivot from, from that. But the reality is everybody fitting hearing aids knows that those fittings are won and lost with acoustic coupling and that you can give it the best fancy signal processing in the world and put the wrong acoustic coupling on it and really have a mess on your hands. And that is something that is very hard to fix on a remote teleconsult. Um, and so the AI dome predictor has been trained um, across multiple dimensions. So it's looking at indicators of satisfaction, like use time and, and benefit, and also um, all kinds of factors that we could pull out of um, the target software in order to create a proposal for the HCP about what is going to be the best dome for both audiological performance and long-term satisfaction. And so with that kind of training in mind, we're giving audiologists now the advice of what is the best possible starting point for this patient to achieve those outcomes, which is generally what the HCP is, is after, um, and limit the chance that they're gonna have to come back um, and address the subsequent sound quality issues um, or other tolerance issues. And again, lead to that best impression of sound quality possible. Okay, so the dome proposer then is working on the basis of the patient's audiogram, correct? And then what? Then from the audiogram, you know what, what gain profile you're gonna deliver, and then you're recommending what dome would work best with that gain profile. 100%, but also using multiple dimensions, including long-term use, treatment adherence, um, a, a lot of things to layer on to even just what is going to give you the, the gain that you need, but also what's going to give you the long-term satisfaction. Okay, got it. So with the, with the new chip, the Aero chip, you've, you've further improved the sound quality. Mm -hmm. And now with the uh, dome proposer, then you're going to make sure you deliver the optimum experience by recommending what would be the best dome for that audiogram and that fitting, exactly correct? Exactly right. Yep. And then you also have this thing called the acoustic optimized vent. Yep. What is that? So that is um, related to products that we're custom fabricating, whether it be an earpiece or a custom um, ITE. And this is a way of looking at all of the acoustics of the ear in order to ensure, again, that right balance between sound quality and audiological benefit. And so this is a tool that's been in place for a while and in combination with our biometric calibration, which helps, helps us to optimize um, the fitting of the device and the maintenance of directivity with the device. Um, between those two things, solving for both sound quality and audiological performance, um, we believe that gives you a really great starting point for anything that you're gonna fit um, custom in your patient's ear. Okay, so essentially the shape of the ear canal is, is partially dictating the construction of the vent. Exactly right. Okay, yep. okay. And you, and you mentioned, well, since we talked about custom products, you also have a custom rechargeable now. We do. So Verto Infineo Rechargeable is a, um, a fully rechargeable product that has all the benefits of Infineo, um, but for patients who want that, that custom form factor and also the convenience of rechargeability. Okay, and how does that physically work then? Is it difficult to put the uh, hearing aids in the case? How are you doing in a custom form factor to you know make a good contact and charge the hearing aids, especially for somebody who might have dexterity issues? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Actually, the design of the charger was one of the key priorities in the development of that product, that we didn't want something that was clunky, difficult to maintain contacts with. And so um, you'll see that there's actually a magnetic connection between the charger and the hearing aid that even if you were to shake the thing and have them tumble around a little bit, they would come back and reseat themselves in exactly the right position to um, maintain charging. So um, it's quite an easy thing if you just sort of drop them in the right direction, 
they'll snap in and give you a uh, reliable charging. So very easy to use and very friendly for anybody with dexterity issues who often in general um, can be very successful with a one piece custom product. So getting it in and out of their ear is fairly simple and then dropping it in the charger has, has really been um, developed with with simplicity. Okay, and, and I know personally from having you know started with the marvels that you've got using bluetooth classic and so you have universal connectivity yep um and i'll tell you uh even the marvels when i got the marvels now bluetooth earphones have improved a lot over time but when yep. i got the marvels in 2018 i thought these are the best bluetooth earphones i've ever had uh -huh. like they paired faster connected more reliably than half of the consumer products that were out there but you've made further improvements what are those that's right so another piece of sound quality and customer satisfaction these days with hearing aids very much has to do with the connectivity to all of one's digital universe, right? So with the Era chip in Infineo, the wireless transmission power is four times greater than previous generations. And so for starters- Still having all day battery life. All day battery life. So with an Infineo Rick, you can have, um, with even with the Sphere product where the DNN is activated, you will get a solid 16 hours of use per day, including eight hours of streaming and activation of the DNN in noise. So of a full day of use. And um, and the key with, with the connectivity now is we took what was already, you know, the most um, universally um, capable hearing aid, which was the, the Lumity with the universal Bluetooth, still the only products that have universal Bluetooth um, connectivity. And we've made that transmission power four times stronger. So the seamless connectivity, but also the, um, the stability of that connection has really been enhanced. So for instance, I don't, I don't know if you ever went into this, but sometimes somebody would have their phone in a position where there was some kind of barrier or isolation between the phone and the ear that was primarily connected to the phone. And there were times where because of distance or some isolating factor, that signal would drop out. Now we've got a, even a stronger connection to begin with, but we also have adaptation to where that phone is connecting. So either ear. So if there's one clear ear pathway, it will, it will choose that one. So we've seen super robust connections and then also improved in the switching behavior between multiple devices. So if you have to go between devices or between acoustic and streaming, um, that can happen instantaneously without even missing a word. So okay. I think the user experience with all of the, the digital universe in this product is, is really exceptional. Well, and I'll personally name the devices, my Android phone, this iPad, two PCs, you know, I mean, so I connect to all of them. But you, you, you mentioned something which I think is worth explaining. Bluetooth Classic was never meant for true wireless devices. So what you're doing is the signal goes to one ear and then you're passing it from ear to ear to the second ear. Correct. That's how Bluetooth Classic works. Uh, LE Audio has an independent stream for each ear. Mm -hmm. And so it begs the question, will this device be ready for LE Audio and will it be ready for Oracast when uh, Oracast transmitters start to appear in different venues? Yep, great question. Um, we're super excited about Oracast. I mean, what a huge patient benefit to have this universal accessibility. And when it is available for patients, we want Phone, the Phonic devices to, to be the enabler and the connection, um, the gateway to that technology. So the, um, the Aero chip is Oracast ready, it's Oracast enabled, and when the time is right and, and that those installations exist, we look forward to, to being able to activate that feature for our patients. Okay, got it. And what about telecoils? How many, how many of the six models have telecoils on them? Yep. Well, we know that there's, there are people that like to use telecoils and we will always have products available that include telecoils. The Infineo platform is focused on the Bluetooth Classic as well as about four other wireless protocols for maintaining accessibility among all kinds of conditions, including TV streaming, including Roger connectivity, including um, Bluetooth low energy for the data um, communication with the app and um, in the future also Oracast. So the, it's a good question to ask, is that, that you still have the same compatibility with the Roger microphone that's in that bag over there, the that's TV right. streamer I have at home, correct? Correct. Okay, 
Uh, but there are there telecoils in any of the models then? Not in the Infineos. Not in the Infineo. Okay, so use one of the previous models. Correct. Uh, if you want telecoil capability. There are a lot of Lumity options for somebody who wants a telecoil. Okay, got it. Is there anything else we should know from an audiological point of view about this device? What makes it different? Why would somebody want to choose an Infineo over Lumity? One thing that we haven't talked about is reliability. And reliability with hearing aids has been something that um, has not always been the primary focus of this industry. We know that on average, HCPs report spending 20 to 30% of time doing troubleshooting, minor repairs, um, dealing with Bluetooth connectivity issues with patients. I mean, HCPs will sometimes remark about being the, uh, the local genius bar for, um, for all the different you know, needs of somebody wanting to connect their digital world to their hearing aids. And so um, we've really put a focus on how to take exceptional care that the reliability of these products is setting a new standard. And that means with the wireless stability and trying to prevent any breakages of that that result in a call to the HCP, but also the devices themselves. So um, these products have been through thousands of hours of testing and go through 135 different tests in order to ensure that they can withstand the daily life of their users. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Thanks, Andy. You're welcome. As I mentioned at the beginning, the big news is the model name Sphere, symbolizing spherical hearing and launched, creatively enough, at the Sphere in Las Vegas on August 7th. In New York, I got a head start on the details from Henny Hausman, responsible for training and implementing the AI model. Before we hear from Henning, let's have a brief look at how AI has been implemented in hearing aids to date. Forgive me if I oversimplify while keeping it brief. Running an AI program requires a deep neural network, or DNN, which is a structure that mimics the way a human brain processes information. A DNN is trained by providing a series of inputs and the corresponding desired outputs. As a result of this training, the DNN can deliver a valid output even when presented with an input that is not identical to what was provided in the training, just as a human brain can. Imagine asking someone who has never seen a cat to draw one. If you give them only a basic description, you might end up with a child's version. With additional detail, the drawing gets more realistic. Add even more details and you will get quite a good rendering. This is how DNNs work. Each little nugget of description is called a parameter. The more parameters the DNN can hold and act on, the closer its output will be to the ideal over a wider range of inputs. Try to get too much done with too few parameters, the result will not be good. In hearing aids, a DNN is typically incorporated as part of the processor chip. The size of the network, the complexity of the training, and the number of parameters needed depends on the task assigned to the DNN and the number of possible outcomes. Relatively small DNNs can be used to match, for example, a sound scene to the nearest of some thousands of training samples. This works well because similar sound scenes will have similar hearing aid settings. Therefore, very large training sets are not required. The DNN itself does not have to be extremely large either, nor does it have to be particularly fast. And yet they have greatly improved the user experience by automatically optimizing hearing aid performance as one goes about their day, including in noise. It sure beats trying to guess the best settings with the app all the time. Signia provided an excellent graphic illustrating another application identifying what is a nearby voice and from which direction it comes for the purpose of focusing the mics on each one. Hearing aids employing this level of AI have gotten better and better, as I've seen comparing my two-generation old Phonak Paradise to the recently released GN Nexi I took to Australia to do live ALE audio on Orcast demos during my presentation there, not to mention the bass and finio itself. The performance difference with both modern devices over the older one was obvious. The Sphere model adds a completely new innovation, a much larger, faster, and more capable DNN in a second chip called DeepSonic. 
This DNN is placed directly in the audio stream, identifying noise and removing much of it in real time while allowing nearby speech to pass through with minimal delay. When given a server farm like what Microsoft uses to clean up audio on Teams calls, or even a modern smartphone, one has a lot of processing power at hand. But to deliver effective speech and noise separation in-ear with all-day wear, one has to make careful choices on both hardware and software. I really enjoyed the conversation with Henning as he described it just exactly what it took to make it work. So I have with me Henning Hausman. He's the Director of Deep Learning Engineering for Sonova, and he's one of the people primarily responsible for the machine learning algorithm within the sphere. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background and how we come to be at this point. Huh. So I started uh, my career as, so I started, so I got a PhD in computer science, um, and I started as a software engineer, mostly in automotive industry, um, and worked on several different, different topics there. Um, and yeah, five years ago, I ended up at Sonova, or Fonac, um, and worked as a, as a deep learner, or as a deep learning performance engineer, more specifically, um, to bring this uh, product to life that we're going to talk about a bit today. Um, meanwhile, I'm leading the team. Yeah. Excellent. Now, people who've seen my earlier podcasts and followed some of my work know I've been following the pace of technology in machine learning, speech from noise separation, and exactly what that means. I've even done some demos with products that weren't capable of being fit in ear, but show how that works. And now you have managed to put it in a hearing aid. And so one of the questions I have, and I think other people will have too, is just how much have you been able to embed in the device? In other words, how large is the, was the training set you used? Mm. How many parameters are actually in the device itself? And what range of situations are you capable of extracting noise from speech? Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna hit you with some numbers now. So we're talking about 4.5 million parameters that are on the device. Um, we have 22 million sound samples that we used for training. And this runs in a very wide uh, range of uh, listening situations. It can deal with uh, lots of different kinds of noise. But on the hearing aid, we only use it in the most uh, challenging situations, which is speech and loud noise. So think of a typical restaurant situation. Um, yeah, as the battery is, uh, of course, a limiting factor in such a small device. Okay, and, and for context, when, when I would talk with people developing for earbuds, uh, it was down to how tightly can we squeeze the number of parameters? You right. know, 500,000 and 300,000 to try and get it to run on a chip that you could actually put in an earbud. You're talking, what did you say, 4.5 4 million, million parameters? Million, yeah. And you said you're also focusing on, on the restaurant scenario. And so in other words, you put a tremendous number of parameters in the restaurant scenario. And so then what that means is you're very accurately able to separate out speech from noise. Would that be a correct way of saying it? That's perfectly correct way, yes. So the more parameters you have, um, the more information can be in the network, um, as you can naturally imagine. So, so in the more different uh, types of noise and different speech uh, can the network distinguish and the more clearly and precisely. Okay, and let's put some context to this then. Okay, so for example, I'm wearing Paradises, they have binaural directional microphones, and the usual kind of acoustic uh, noise reduction techniques and so on, and I get a certain amount of SNR improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does this do in comparison to what I'm wearing? When you're talking about what runs on Paradise, for example, um, you will have a classical algorithm, so rule-based system where um, you give uh, the rules as, as a software developer for the, for the hearing aid, you provide the rules, you prov uh, and then the system gets some input and computes some output. Um, in deep learning, what we do is we give the input and the desired output, and then we run a procedure that's called training. And with the parameters uh, that, that we provide uh, in the training process, we derive the rules. So the network learns itself basically 
what are the rules? What, how do I distinguish speech from uh, noise in every single relevant situation? Right, so if I, were to, if I were to rephrase that, what I have now and what everybody has in their devices right now is really sound scene classifiers, which oh, is, yeah. right, it's a more or less a, a convenience feature. In other words, the automatic modes work very well because you're identifying what sound scene I'm in and doing classical hearing aid adjustments with it. Yeah, so that's a good point. We have uh, machine learning for uh, classification in hearing aids for quite some time. Um, that's usually more on the machine learning, not so much on the deep learning side. So that's a simpler class of, of AI algorithms where you also need more engineering and more, more tinkering to get it to work. And it's also a simpler, simpler problem, simpler problem. Um, because you have a number of sound scenes that you can classify. It can be in a church or in a restaurant or in silent or listening to music or whatever scenes you mo uh, may have. But that's it. And then if you look at speech, where you have every fraction of a second and you sample with lots of different frequencies in this, there's much more information to get right. So it's a much harder problem. And this is inline. The sound classifier is actually not inline the audio stream. It's controlling the hearing aid settings. Exactly. You are now in line with the audio stream. Exactly. The sound classifier is separate from the audio stream. It's the time-wise decoupled. So you can afford to only classify once per second or whatever. Uh, you don't need to classify every single fraction of a second, right? You don't even want to change, uh, have it to change too frequently anyway. Um, but with sound cleaning, every single sample, every bit of information that uh, goes in needs to be cleaned. And all that needs to go through the DNA. So you need a lot of computational power to make that happen. And so then you're able to actually to identify which component of this complex audio spectrum that's coming at me is noise and what is speech. You pass on or recreate the speech and you reject the noise. Is that a correct understanding? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really nice way to put it. Um, if you want to get really technical, we compute a mask, a complex mask that we multiply with our audio stream um, okay. every single frame. And so then as a practical matter for a hearing aid user, let's talk about SNR improvement first. Then what does that mean for ability to understand speech in a challenging, noisy situation compared to what classical devices do? So we get a 10 dB SNR improvement, which is unprecedented. This is 3.7 dB more than any hearing aid so far could do. Um, what does it mean? In practical terms, you will understand two to three times more uh, of the words that you're hearing. Okay, so I'm getting 10 dB improvement in SNR over nothing and say between 3 and 4 dB improvement over a classical hearing aid. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that, that's a hard one, 3 and 4 dB. I mean, typically when you go from generation to generation, like for example, my marvels to my paradise, what were we talking? Maybe 1 dB improvement, something like that? One, one and a half? Not I three, don't, I, I don't right? know. I don't know exactly. <laughs> Certainly not three. So uh, three is very hard one. How many years were actually involved in making this happen? That was five years. So we, t we started in 2019. Um, yeah, and it was quite a bit of work <laughs> because we did um, not only uh, build the DNN, but we built the hardware, the deep sonic chip with it. And it was a very challenging way to um, have this co-design. We had, had the first the DNN on a laptop running and uh, that would be heating up uh, when it was doing the demo, right? And then at some point we brought it down to a phone and yeah, now we have it in a hearing aid. And even, even training the hearing aid, training the model, for example, what goes into training the model and what kind of computational complexity was involved? So you have to imagine 100 GPUs and that's not the, your gamer, gaming graphics card that you would buy in the store, but that's professional grade uh, deep learning GPUs. Um, and then you train for months and months. You train multiple of these models, actually. Um, and then you select the best ones of them. Um, and then you do a lot of listening tests, uh, go maybe back to the drawing board, uh, try to uh, figure out what the target function for the next run should be. Because 
you have some idea of what the mathematical goal is you optimize for, but you of course have to constantly reality check that. Okay, and how many GPUs did you say you were running? Hundreds. Hundreds. <laughs> And so I, a lot of people are going to be familiar with NVIDIA and how they've been, and maybe you're not using NVIDIA's, but just as an example, everybody's been following, uh, you know, their AI activity and how their stock has gone up so much because everybody uses their GPUs. Uh, and you're running hundreds of those. So this is a really sophisticated effort to, tra to, tra to train the model. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a lot of investment that we did. Um, it's not the only thing, it's also getting all the data, getting the data into a really good shape. So you want to have a lot of noise data that covers a wide array of uh, situations. You want to have lots of speech data that covers also a wide array of situations. You want, don't want the network to focus only on male speakers or only on female speakers, but it should all be equalized, all these kind of things. Um, yeah, and you have to do a lot of tuning and engineering, and of course, a lot of audiology also goes into this. So. Well, I'm very much looking forward to trying the device. I, I don't, I can't even count anymore how many different ear-worn things have gone into my ears, and I'm very much looking forward to trying this one. Thanks for spending some time with me. Well, thank you. Spherical hearing refers to the fact that the DNN removes noise regardless of direction, enabling one to hear everyone around them equally well, regardless of where they're positioned. Some directionality can still be used to deliver even better performance toward the front, but the DNN does not depend on it. I wear the spheres in New York City, Las Vegas, and in various settings in my hometown. I can tell you that AI speech and noise separation really works well. I believe in the future we will look at this as a seminal moment in hearing device evolution, just as we do with digital hearing aids today. With any radically new technology, the question becomes, where do we go from here? In a hallway conversation at the launch event in Las Vegas, Stefan Lawner touched on their initial goals for the development of Sphere. Then we discussed the different directions they could take. It is part of a concerted effort to meet the needs of people with all levels of hearing loss, including those with normal audiograms who have difficulty hearing and noise. I'll let him have the final word. So I have with me here, Stefan Lawner. Stefan, thank you for joining me. Uh, please tell everyone a few words about yourself. My name is Stefan Launer. As you said, I'm the VP of Audiology and Health Innovation. I'm a physicist by training. So I did my PhD thesis on basic hearing science and, uh, and hearing impairment. I joined uh, FUNAC in 1995, now Sonova, and uh, I have been always involved in uh, collaborating with a lot of academic external partners, driving research in hearing science, in signal processing, and in also hearing care delivery models and a lot of technology developments. Terrific. Quite a background which you bring, you know, experience you bring to the table, which really culminates in the development of the sphere in particular, which is what I want to talk with you about. First off, congratulations. I've been wearing the spheres since uh, Sunday now and Thank getting you. a lot of experience with them in the inline DNN really works. Thank so you. So very, very nicely done. Yeah. Thank you. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more because it's clear that you've been working on this for some time, as, as far as I could tell, at least since 2019 and maybe a little bit before. How did you actually start to think about inline deep neural networks and the fact that you could apply them to hearing aids? When did that first that thought process begin and, and set off the timeline that yeah, so, it in today? So for me, I mean, I, I did my PhD in a group where they already in the 95 and then afterwards until 2000 worked on applying neural networks for speech enhancement in all sorts of configurations, but it never worked. So neural networks as a tool set have been around for a long time. And by 2005, you know, the work, the research on DNNs really took off and um, we saw a lot of powerful developments and we were following this field very closely. We were uh, scouting, exploring a lot. We had our own team uh, trying out things. And I think it was around 2016, 2017, when we started to realize mm, it's getting close to these things becoming um, potentially possible. and. In 2018, 2019, we really realized, oh, this is the moment where we have to take a decision and go all in um, and develop such a solution. We realized 
the DNNs, the large DNNs had become very powerful uh, to really provide a significant improvement in speech intelligibility. The only downside was they were pretty big. So uh, uh, that was the bet that we had to take back then. And it's interesting because I've been watching it too, thinking about it in the consumer world. And even at CES a couple of years ago, I did some interviews and live demos with some of the startups working on this. The problem being that you couldn't get enough parameters into a viable chip for in-ear, so there were limitations. A lot of demos are being run on smartphones. Yeah. And I've been following the consumer chip development, wondering when it's gonna get big enough to do something really interesting. You obviously had to take your own path to shortcut that process. Well, what we did, and that is something we have always been doing, we always wanted to be in control of our own destiny. And that's why we kept developing our own chips over many years. We did that with the digital chips. We did that with the wireless radio. And by 2019, we also decided, hey, these DNNs, they have become powerful. We should try to get a chip done that runs on the power budget and size constraints of a hearing instrument and that is powerful enough to really run a large-scale DNN optimized for the task of speech enhancement. So it's a very special network structure um, with millions of parameters uh, and we decided to develop this chip and that's what we have been doing over the past years. And it's interesting to think about exactly how you did it because you're getting about 10 dB noise reduction. And I've seen, you know, demos where you could get far more than that, but they have other limitations. For example, you don't have enough parameters to be able to fit in here and handle all the world's languages. And so what you've done is you've made it work very well with 10 dB noise reduction, which in the hearing world is a lot, yeah. but, you know, below what the ultimate capability would be when you have a larger model and more parameters. Uh, I can think of some other use cases too, but I want to ask you, where is this going? And now I understand you probably have version two of the chip being taped out right now, and you've got more room to play. In what directions will you take this going forward? Yeah. So um, first of all, we have taken a first step, but when you took a first step, you always know, oops, we could have done better here and here and here. So lots of learnings. So one of the first or the next steps is optimize the current solution in terms of computational complexity, computational efficiency, and the chip architecture. So we are um, definitely evolving the solution we have. That's a clear pathway for us, and there is quite some room to improve here. But we are also thinking about lots of other applications. And um, in, the, in the world of hearing care, uh, the one question I've always received chokingly by the audience of hearing impaired people is, when do I get the spouse enhancer, or sometimes the spouse cancel, I know. The idea of, uh, of a signal processing tool that can pick out a specific voice and amplify it. So um, speaker tracking uh, is, uh, is an old uh, age old topic and age old question and things like that. Identify specific scenes, identify specific target signals, pick them out, enhance them. That's um, a next big step the, that we and the whole research community is uh, is working on. And then you can also apply larger scale DNN models to identify acoustic scenes, to combine them with other sensors, integrate different types of information. So we now have a completely different way of computing things. We have this tool of powerful DNNs in the hearing instrument, and we have lots of different applications now uh, ahead of us. Well, that makes perfect sense because in experiencing the DNN, it's very, very good. The voices are very natural. So you haven't tried to press to the absolute maximum amount of noise reduction in exchange for making the voices sound less natural. So, I mean, this is an interesting point. When you design a hearing instrument, you have to have a hearing instrument that is natural and authentic. There is no point in a noisy restaurant to kill the entire noise floor because it tells you something about the environment. It gives you information when the servers, the waiters are approaching you and asking you questions. And you need to be aware of what's going on around you. So it's a subtle balance of enhancing the speech signal while still maintaining environmental awareness that yeah. you have to find. It makes perfect sense. And and I found in, in trying it, there were times when I would, I, I had created a mode where I went really directional with the mics. 
because you generally want at Omni so that when the server comes up over here and addresses you, you have heard them straight away. But on the other hand, there's a loud person at the table next to me I have no desire to hear. So then I would take additional advantage of the directional mics and the DNN simultaneously. Yeah. But then that made me think what you just said too. There are actually consumer solutions coming out now that are smartphone based that are actually doing voice identification. And so you can, you can say, I want to attend to this voice. I want to attend to this voice. But I almost thought about it in the opposite. If you're trying to take a user, especially one that's only moderately adept at the smartphone, most of the time you want it running automatically. You don't have to do a thing, but a voice rejector would be interesting. So a voice rejector in that you really suppress certain voices or, or what do you mean? Yeah, exactly. So if I'm at a table in a crowded restaurant and it's all good, I've got two or three people here and I'm hearing them you know, perfectly well because of the deep neural network running in more or less omnidirectional yep. mode. But there's a really loud person over here I don't want. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting point. You know, you could do this by placing a strong notch behind you um, in a beam former, but that's then difficult if you move your body or the person moves. Or you could, you know, try to tag um, the voice or the, the, the sound that you want to suppress and briefly train a network. And these are also solutions that various groups in the work in the world are working on, trying to identify also trying to find out how do we handle the logistics? Because when you are in this situation, you need to have a way that is efficient to say, it's this source that I want to cancel. And, and how do you identify it? How, you, how do you train your network and how do you stabilize it? So I think the technology is there to do it. The question is more, how do we operationalize it and how do we integrate it in a very usable uh, way for the, for the user of the device? So in the DNN, how did you bring about the development of the testing over this timeline? Yeah. So when we developed the DNN, we also had partners we worked with um, to, to help us build um, skills in the really deep neural network technology for speech enhancement and the computational optimization. We built a lot of uh, internal knowledge and we also had partners who helped us develop the uh, the chip technology. So we really applied our typical um, open innovation model. And the crucial point also was if you do a cutting edge development like this development of this chip, it's never a straight development process. It's a pretty exciting and at times nerve wracking roller coaster ride. And we had to put a lot of energy in also um, testing the solution along the way. So we also developed another DNN that we trained on human subjects rating. So we had hundreds of people on the internet rate sound samples in terms of sound quality and speech intelligibility. We used these results to train another DNN that helped us to select the optimal architecture. We did a lot of testing with prototypes, with technical measures, and we did a lot of testing with um, subjects in different laboratories, also with external people. And this work has also been published. Okay, and so you're really, you're really having a process that's running in parallel because you're developing the model, which is informing the chip development, what the needs of the chip were. And at the same time, as you're starting to tape out the chip, that's going to inform what you can do in terms of the model, correct? And so absolutely. you really had to meet these two together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so with the development of the chip, we started the development of the integration of the algorithm in a full-blown hearing instrument and to test it under really realistic conditions with prototypes on different levels, on laptop level, on smartphone level, with integrated uh, hearing instrument functionality, and at the end in prototypes of hearing instruments. And we always tested that at least in two labs with different languages, different background noises, different acoustics. So it was quite a bit of testing to really be sure the thing works. Yeah, which certainly explains the long development timeline. And yes. anything this new that's never been done before is going to take a while to get it right. Yes. And I can tell you as an actual hearing impaired person, if you don't get it right, things start sounding unnatural. You start to lose directionality. Yep. Um, you start, you know, the voices start sounding unnatural. They become less intelligible. And that's, we really don't want to go there. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you think about hearing care more generally, this, you know, this capability in particular, what additional needs can you meet with it 
that you aren't meeting now. For example, I think about the 25 million people that the NAL identified as having normal audiograms, but difficult to hearing speech and noise. How do you yeah. see this technology helping there? See, I think there is quite a bit of convergence in general between the consumer audio and uh, the hearing care. Uh, and we still have quite different requirements in lots of terms of usability and, and, and things like that. But when we think about technologies like the active noise cancellation, the consumer or now this um, very powerful uh, uh, speech enhancement tool that we have, I see quite a lot of benefit if they converge. Um, and especially this technology now is also beneficial for people who have listening difficulties, but normal audiograms. Um, a lot of my team colleagues have been wearing that and thought, oh, that's quite helpful in a really noisy place, in a noisy bar. <clears throat> they benefit quite a bit from that. So I see really quite some application of this technology also um, for this segment. We have to solve the wearing comfort because you have to close the uh, ear molds a little bit to really have powerful results. But that's things that we can handle. And then we have to increase the acceptance of these devices. But it offers us a lot of opportunities moving forward. Well, an acceptance of these devices is, is a great lead in to what I've been thinking about for a while, and that is how do we further increase the adoption rates, reaching populations who either don't have access today or hesitant to use today's solutions? How do you see looking holistically in terms of devices, in terms of how hearing care is delivered, and in terms of how we message the benefits of treating your hearing loss to the general population? How do you see what are the key strategies going forward to increase adoption rates on all of those axes? Yeah, so first and foremost, I would also like to appreciate and emphasize that adoption of hearing instruments over the past 20 years, as we can learn from MarkTrack and Eurotrack, especially in countries like the US, like Germany, with a well-developed infrastructure for hearing care delivery, adoption has significantly increased. It's not 100%, it's below 50 in most countries, but it has doubled over the past 20 years, and, and we should appreciate that. I think what is contributing to that is the performance of the hearing instruments in general has increased. That's also something we can see when we look at the wearing time of hearing instruments. Uh, there are several studies published by several um, uh, research groups from different manufacturers also talking about hearing instruments being used on average 12 hours per day and the number of devices in the drawer has, has decreased. So it shows that we probably have risen the awareness and talked about the importance of hearing care. And I think that's a general theme that we need to drive forward even more to emphasize how important hearing is beyond hearing. You know, hearing is important for social interaction. Hearing is the sense that helps us as a social glue. Um, it helps us connect with friends, with families. We have learned from a couple of studies how hearing care contributes to maintaining cognitive health, the ACHIEVE study, especially in people at risk. Uh, we have seen other correlations between hearing care and healthy living and aging. And I think that's a major theme we have to keep driving forward to emphasize to the broader population about the importance of hearing and hearing well uh, moving forward. I think we also have to become more specific because we love to talk about people with hearing loss and then we talk about um, people with a mild hearing loss and we put them all in the same basket, people with a mild hearing loss, people with a profound hearing loss. I think we have to become more specific, identify what is the target group we are trying to reach and then identify how do we talk to this target group and what are the products that we are offering to this target group. I think that's also an important discussion to have in terms of different target groups and their needs for listening devices or the technology, education, awareness, why it matters, and maybe also models of care delivery. Uh, we always talk about OTC or not to OTC, instead of thinking about, uh, wait a minute, which target group which ne needs which model and how can we blend different care models to become a, a continuum. So I think that's something we should be working on more in the future, be more specific what hearing care means for different target groups we are trying to reach. I really love that because it is a 
it's a line, it's a continuous line, right? And to divide it up between one and the other, I think, leaves a big hole in the middle in the way we talk with people about it. But I also think that's actually probably the biggest benefit of OTC is that it started this conversation. I mean, in the general public, at least in the U.S., there was a whole lot of press around hearing care and the importance of hearing care with the arrival of OTC. Yeah. And now that you're thinking, and of course, you've got Sennheiser on one end of the line. So you, you know, you have you can do the whole continuum of hearing care. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how you address all levels of hearing loss, what those people's needs are how you can deliver care to those people and give them yeah. a more satisfying lifestyle. I'm really looking forward to seeing you go forward doing that. Yeah, I mean, this is something we as an organization certainly drive, but I think this is also something the entire community has to pick up kind of as a task I, together. I completely agree with you. Well, listen, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you. you spending some time. Very busy conference. Uh, you you know, had lots to do, and yet you took some time to talk with us. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.